To successfully complete this program and be awarded one contact hour, you must register for the webinar with an email address, attend at least 50 minutes of the seminar, and complete the online evaluation. On today, we are very pleased to have two outstanding nurse scientists to join us to discuss bridging the research and evidence-based practice gap, the changing role of the nurse scientist. I will briefly introduce them to you now. First, we have Dr. Janine Overcash, who is a clinical associate professor at The Ohio State University College of Nursing. Dr. Overcash is a geriatric nurse practitioner specializing in the care of the older breast cancer adults. Dr. Overcash has authored over 40 peer-reviewed journal articles in the area of geriatric assessment. A book entitled The Older Cancer Patient, A Guide for Nurses and Related Professionals, highlights principles of care of the older person with cancer, and this book received the American Journal of Nursing Award. Dr. Overcash also completed a postdoctoral fellowship with the John A. Hartford Building Academic Geriatric Nursing Capacity Program. She is currently interested in maintaining functional status of older women undergoing chemotherapy and creating and sustaining a geriatric oncology ambulatory care clinic focus. A couple of weeks ago, Dr. Overcash was recognized at the American Academy of Nursing through her selection as a fellow. She will be our first speaker. Before she begins, I will also introduce Dr. Mary Ellen Delafield, who received her PhD in nursing at UCLA. She was awarded a postdoctoral fellowship at UCSF in 2004 to 2006. She was also a Veterans Health Administration Health Services Research and Development Career Development awardee from 2008 to 2012. Since that time, she has worked as a research nurse scientist at the VA San Diego Healthcare System. She is a clinical professor at the Han School of Nursing and Health Sciences at University of San Diego, California. For four years, For four years she was a member, was a member of the VA Health Administrator's National Workforce Evidence Based Practice. She is a member of the VA Nursing Research Field Advisory Committee. I hear an echo. Laura, are you able to see that? I'll keep talking. Ashley, you need to turn off your speaker so you don't have an echo. Okay. There we go. She's a member of the VA Nursing Research Field Advisory Committee, and that's from 2017 to 2021. She served as the second vice president of research for Sigma Theta Tau International's San Diego Zeta Mu at large chapter for four years. And in her current position, Dr. Delafield serves as a resource to nursing staff members working on evidence-based projects or pilot research studies. We are very pleased that they're able to join us today to share their knowledge and expertise with us. Before Dr. Overcash begins, Please make sure your phone is muted so we can hear both presentations. So, Dr. Overcash? Hi, oh, yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I want to thank everyone for allowing me to talk. Um, and uh, I'm very interested, certainly, in this uh, topic because I think we are having some changing roles of the nurse scientists, um, certainly in the last few years. So, um, I'm just going to advance these right like this. Yep. So I have no um, conflict of interest to disclose. And when we were talking about making this project or this um, talk, we were asked to talk about a little bit about ourselves and our tra track through our um, academic uh, preparation as well as where it has gotten us so far. And um, I'm from a small town in Florida. I graduated from Florida State University and then went on to University of South Florida. And then I enjoyed um, my PhD in applied anthropology. I went to the wild side and enjoyed every minute of it. Then I did my postdoc at the Hartford Foundation in the Moffitt Cancer Center. So I had a really uh, nice 
sort of uh, entree into research and the world of academic nursing. And like everything in nursing, a lot of things, well, I like a lot of things in nursing, it was very serendipitous. I was a geriatric nurse practitioner, and I was looking for a job. And our friends at the Moffitt Cancer Center said, hey, we need a new senior adult oncology program established, and we need a GNP. You don't need to know anything about oncology. And I thought, well, that's great, because I don't. And so I showed up, and boy, did you have to know a lot about oncology. That was quite a, a road that I took. But boy, did it help develop me professionally. And so we started the Senior Adult Oncology Program. I took off seeing patients, and I loved it. And from that, I was able to um, gain interest in doing a PhD. But before I did that, I learned that the more I disseminated my geriatric oncology program, I disseminated information about the program, any sort of small data that we were collecting, just absolutely anything. We disseminated all over the place in terms of presentation and publication, I learned it was critical to the success of my program. The more notoriety we got, the more likely administration was uh, going to keep us around. And so I really focused on my writing, which then led into research, which led me into my PhD program. And I think working so closely in research before I even got to my PhD program really helped me. And I learned how to incorporate cancer care into um, the, the, the research that we were doing every day in the clinic. You know, how could we develop this better? How could we do this assessment more streamlined? How could we, what does it mean when somebody has depression and perhaps fatigue? So we were really able to drive our clinical practice through existing research and where we wanted our research to go. And it was also vice versa as well. We really wanted to know how do we conduct geriatric assessment in a small amount of time in an outpatient clinic. Boy, that was really hard, and it continues to be hard to this day. I think we learned more about how not to do that than we do about how to do that, but that was how the research sort of played out for us. And, and it was quite a walk, and it's ongoing today. I, I didn't do the math, but it's been 20 years, I bet. And um, we still are kind of slogging through understanding um, this concept. But it, again, it drives that clinical research, which is so important. So as we were seeing patients, and I talked about the clinical inquiry that guided my research, I loved having an opportunity with the Hartford to be able to conduct further research, to kind of be bought out of some time to be able to refine what we were doing in our research in the clinical arena. And I enjoyed understanding, I think it was my clinical knowledge that really drove what we were asking as a nurse scientist, as a, as a researcher, because we always wanted to be more efficient, more productive, more um, beneficial for patient care. And that's what really dro drove our practical research. And at this time, I don't know that any of us were looking for funding. We really were trying to, to move our program forward. So I sort of came to hear or to, to kind of think about um, research from a small perspective. And I wrote a few articles on research with the little r. These were not great big funded research. We were really just carrying out research funded through our agencies to really solve small problems. And over time, we were able to really understand more about geriatric assessment because if we waited for funding, we'd probably still be waiting. So it became just really small bits of the pie that we were kind of addressing. And over the years, um, I worked at Moffitt and teaching at the University of South Florida. I was um, recruited up here at Ohio State. I had never lived north of Tallahassee, so when I came up here, that was a little bit of a shock with the weather. And so I, I became director of nursing research at the James, and that was a lovely role. I um, mean, it really differed than academic research, and it really differed from my clinical research, because that research was, was mine that I was moving forward. And I realized that I had to take what I had done and sort of spread the news to other nurses that were also interested in this, getting started doing the same thing I was doing. And so my role as director really helped promote research. Recorded. 
at all levels. And so it was understanding where people were at the time, what resources they had, and how do I help them disseminate this data in a reasonable manner? How can I promote nurses to be able to do this? Because in nursing, as all y'all know, we often do research on the side as, as a, in addition to everything else that we're doing, right? You know, no one's cut, given us a, a break in our pa patient care or any other responsibility that we have at the hospital. We're doing that in addition, in addition to all other responsibilities. So how do you fit that in? How do you set that up for success? Because a lot of times the model itself is setting up for failure. So we really worked at that when I really took that role at, the, at, the, um, at Ohio State at the James. We looked at low-hanging fruit. You know, what have people done now that we can easily help disseminate? And I would help people learn how to make um, uh, drafts of publications and what sort of columns could perhaps that we um, target to disseminate data. And we had a good time at that, but it took, it took a lot of um, bandwidth, certainly, to, to coordinate that. And then what was really a big role in this nurse scientist role was how do we promote nursing inclusion in existing interdisciplinary research protocols? As all of y'all know in these big cancer centers, you know, a lot of times bench science and medicine have established research protocols. How does nursing get a piece of that? How do we add a multidisciplinary flair to these things? And, you know, how is it that we can perhaps be included in these core grants in our big medical centers and our academic cancer centers, essentially? And that's an ongoing discussion, and I think that's a primary role of the nurse scientist to ensure that there is some con inclusion um, with our other colleagues in promoting nursing research. I enjoyed that role very much, but then I came back to Ohio State as an associate clinical professor, and I love this role very much. It's really my home in, in terms of teaching. I enjoy teaching. I enjoy understanding how to teach better. I've never seen things change so much in my career with how uh, teaching has changed in terms of electronic teaching, all the m massive amounts of uh, software you can use in order to teach online and as well as in class. Just things have just really exploded in terms of teaching. And so how do we keep current in that? How do I do that well? And it is a constant challenge. But in my academic role, I continue to see patients, so I'm always current. And I'm paying attention to our nursing competencies, particularly I'm director of the adult Giro NP program and the CNS program, and how are we ensure, ensure that we're meeting these competencies? So my inquiry changed a little bit, right? It came into academics. How do we do this best? How do we inspire best practice? And one of my best sentences, I think, here in this slide is, to be a positive part of the student's nursing school memory. I want to be the thing they smile about and they enjoy to laugh or they enjoyed learning about assessment or about how to care for an older person. That they, they, they pair that with, you know, a good time in learning and, 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 a, and a valuable time in learning. And that's not easy. You know, it really requires a lot of uh, planning. And I'm not sure I always hit that mark, but it's something that I, I keep ahead of me to try to achieve. But that's part of that academic role. It's part of that nurse scientist role. And it's part of my uh, responsibility to my profession. In my academic role, I still do research. You know, how do we maintain a funded trajectory of research? And it's not easy. You know, it, it, it is a constant struggle, especially when you do small clinical research programs. You know, how do we look at program grants to forward new academic programs, particularly in geriatric education? I'm always interested in how we can get more NPs to think about geriatrics from a specialty care perspective, from an acute care perspective, that we're getting, giving trained geriatric evidence-based practice through research um, into areas that generally aren't considered geriatric. But that has been a goal and that hopefully we will continue to or be successful in getting some more program grants. My clinical research continues to be my primary focus. We're really able to, we've published a lot lately on findings from our comprehensive geriatric assessment on how do you perform this, sustainable geriatric oncology outpatient programs. That's been a big issue uh, this year. How do you sustain these programs, especially in the midst of healthcare cutbacks? Um, and we have really enjoyed 
um, you know, again, publishing on that topic. But we continue to publish. We try to publish a few times a year so that that clinical research, um, we're generating new, new information on which we can base pra uh, projects. And then our DMP students perhaps can look at that from an evidence-based practice uh, model once that has been developed. In my academic role, particularly in research, I love mentoring. I love having young students come and see how research is so hands-on, is so active. You know, we're in, the we're in the room seeing the patient and we want to know how to do something better. We start thinking about that as a research project. And I think when you see that active uh, research kind of come to life, it's a really cool thing for the student. It's a cool thing for me. I, and that's probably why I enjoy it so much. And the traditional role of service to the university and to the profession. My role in an academic center, certainly I have administrative roles, but I also have a role to geriatric education to ensure that our students are getting the geriatrics that they so need and as part of these competencies. And that has been my service to the university and service to the profession. I love to serve on as many boards as I can and as many councils or, or you know, writing groups, anything, to be able to promote, number one, the nurse scientist role, academic nursing, and geriatric nursing, and geriatric needs of students. So that role is one of my favorites as well. I, as you see, I really love my job. I, I truly, you know, while I don't know if I hit all these benchmarks all the time, they're, you know, they're on the table. It's where I enjoy, you know, what I enjoy thinking about. But leadership, particularly in research, scholarly leadership is mentoring, is being that exemplar. You know, and it's being, I show my students all of the reviews that I get when I do my publications to say, hey, listen, you know, 10 pages of editorial comments, you can overcome this, don't give up. This is what you have to do. And I think in seeing that um, exemplar, that mentoring, that things become doable for students. And it's so very important to have them right there in, in, you know, with you as we are moving forward. Because I, hopefully these will be people that take my spot here in a few years. Um, leadership in ed as an educator, I take my, um, my, my leadership roles very seriously as program leader of the Adult Juro NP program and CNS program. I really value that. I can do my, I do, you know, who do we accept into our program? We look at evidence-based holistic admissions to be able to offer acceptance to a wide variety of students. And that, is, that leadership and showing how that can be done, I think, really contributes to certainly our academic nursing and interdisciplinary networking. I think as a leader, we are always networking with other colleges, with you know, other professions. We're putting on a um, lecture on implicit bias, and we're doing it through three or four of uh, different colleges are doing it, and we're having a great time with it. It's only a two-hour lecture, but so many of us have these great ideas that we um, have enjoyed the planning. If the students don't like it, I, I hope they do, we have enjoyed the planning. It will be of no matter because we have enjoyed the planning. It's been so, so much fun, and I love that interdisciplinary networking because it has really been such a rich um, experience. Leadership in academics, the uh, student research relationship. You know, especially as, as the director of the MP program, when we say research, a lot of students want to run. I mean, I could watch the, I, I watch the response. And I think that when we solve the mystery, doing small research projects, when they see, again, the active research ideas come alive in the clinic, that it makes it doable for them and creates a nice um, uh, experience with research. So many students feel they can't do research based on a bad class they got in undergraduate research at some point in their life. It's all that took to, for them to think they can't do it. And it takes a lot of undoing of that notion, I think, and positive mentorship and exemplars to be able to empower students to conduct a small part of research. You're always an ambassador. You're always an ambassador of nursing research um, in academics. You want to move our profession forward, and particularly in geriatrics. But I also talk about the business of research and the business of dissemination. Part of being a leader is to delegate and to um, help a group understand who's going to be the PI on a certain project, who's going to be on the project, who's going to be on, you know, 
first author, second author, third author. All of that is the business, I think, of the business of research. It's solving that issue before you even start because you take a lot of um, problems off the table when you, you do that proactive planning. And that takes leadership. You know, how is that arranged? How is that considered? Who's going to do that? You don't want to hurt anyone's feelings, but you've had, what really hurts someone's feelings is to not have that conversation on that business and uh, expectations aren't met at the end of the day. So that's an important element, certainly, of leadership. Lessons learned. I just think so much of inspiring research has just really been, you know, something that has evolved. I was for years learning how to do my own research, let inspire anyone else. But over the years, I have learned how to be confident enough in my projects to be able to inspire people to do theirs. Small, short-term projects with short-term goals, things that can be met, particularly in light of all the other responsibilities our nurses have across the medical center or as students have uh, when they come to school. Construct groups. You know, working in groups helps everyone. Very rarely do I do help someone through the research project just one person. I try to do two or three uh, students or two or three uh, nurses from our medical center so that everybody learns together. It's a working type of group. We can delegate tasks and we can divide and conquer and then everybody learns and has a su successful outcome. And that successful outcome typically in my perspective is dissemination of a publication or <clears throat> a research project or um, a presentation. Hold on. So as EVP, you know, we have so many DMP students that are looking at everyday issues using data we haven't used that, that is really making an impact on clinical practice. The goal is to look for projects in everyday meetings and what patient people do every day. You know, as we think about developing projects for our DMP students, often it's right under their nose, right? They're working on it every day. And so using your expertise to guide your your ideas that impact EVP and impact research is so very important. Look within a student's specialty area or a nurse's specialty area in order for them to flourish. Study the things you're working with, the things you're an expert on, the things you know, and help understand should this be part of a clinical ladder. And so many of our uh, students are using the clinical ladder here at the Ohio State Medical Center that um, we can really kind of give an impact not only on their professional development, but on some of the um, goals they want to achieve in terms of science. So I am at the Ohio State, if, if anyone has a question or whatever, to just email me. I, I hope that this um, talk has given some sort of perspective in the changing world of the nurse scientist. I will say I've seen you know, we have a growth in our CNS program now that comes from a lot with the magnet, uh, excuse me, program, and more people wanting to do research and clinical research at the bedside. That's a beautiful change. And I think that we've, I mean, I've seen so much of it that it's, it's just fantastic. Our CNS program went from one person to 12 persons, and many of them are willing and want to do research at the bedside. Um, at the medical center. So I think these are brilliant changes. I'm glad I've uh, enjoyed over my career. And I thank you very much uh, for your attention. And Mary Ellen, if you want to uh, currently now uh, do your uh, lecture. Well, thank you, Dr. Overcash. Can you all hear me? Be am, am I being heard? Am I on mute? Uh, we can hear you fine. Oh, okay. <laughs> You're not on mute. I'm, I'm sorry. Okay. Well, I just, I have to say that you have just heard an absolutely outstanding uh, summary of, a, of an excellent, excellent, excellent research nurse scientist in, in an academic setting. I mean and that, that very, 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 very,
there's a lot of echo. tried so, so hard to, to be prepared, prepared um, to, to, to not have, have any experience like this for you. Anyway, anyway uh, I, I think that this, I think that this, that this uh, are, are you getting, getting feedback? feedback? Yes, you need to mute your computer. Well, well I'm, I'm on, on my cell phone. My, my cell, cell phone. phone. Uh, can you take yourself off the speakerphone? Oh, okay. Is that better? A lot better. Okay. All right. Because I'm still hearing it, so it's better for you. Uh, for me, on my end, yes. Um, is everybody else still hearing a little bit of feedback? Okay, I, I'm going to um, continue. And my apologies, not that it's, I hope it's not my fault. Um, I have a story to tell you that is um, a bit of a contrast to, to the experiences that have been described before. Uh, I have spent most of my time the last 20 years at VA San Diego Healthcare Center as a research nurse scientist. And, and I would, I'm sorry, how do I advance the slides? Okay. okay. Is, is, I, I hope, hope this, this is better, better for you. Okay. Do I just uh, do enter or next? I really apologize. I just seem like I'm a dork here. Um, Okay. All right. Actually, part of this experience is that the VA, as you may understand, is very strict about what uh, software can be used within the system and uh, not used. So actually, I'm at home today, and uh, that's the best way we could do it. Anyway. I, I will describe an experience that is more focused on the impact of the context, the organization in which I work, really the system within, I, within which I work, and my personal research interest in the context of practice as it relates to nursing homes. So I hope you're seeing the slide of education. I, I went to UCLA, both for my bachelor's degree and my master's degree. Then I had a nice experience at Rush because I had, have and had a very interesting um, system of uh, a role of teachers, nurses, clinicians. So that was a sophisticating kind of experience. And then I had the opportunity to go to to work with Charlene Harrington, who happens to be, for, for me, 
you know, like the best person because she's done extensive work in nurse staffing and Medicare and Medicaid. So uh, after that, I was able to work part-time so that I could uh, apply for this Career Development Award. And what this is, is this is like a K Award in, in other systems. How can I? OK. So I'm going to expand on that, on this idea. I want to say this first. The VA is very, very supportive of research in many domains, in health services research in particular, because that's my area. However, what I've come to, to learn, which I didn't know, which I wish I did know, is that the especially in health services, the VA has certain preferences for frameworks, for approaches, uh, for methodologies. And uh, it, I wish I had known that before. It's sort of a, a grantsmanship kind of a thing that um, I wasn't aware of. But now I can see it probably would have been better to be sensitive to that. Now, in fairness to me, we, I had come to the VA when they had a major research entity. It was called the Query for HIV. So we had resources and a, a regular center. But over time, that center disappeared. So basically, all of us nurses, uh, physicians, psychologists were on our own pretty much in terms of having an infrastructure and resources. So uh, that's part of why I wasn't, I wasn't um, able to be sensitive to this framework issue sooner. Now, I was a member of the nursing research organization, happened to be three people. And it's just a fact that BHA, although it's super supportive of researchers, nurse researchers, it actually still does not have a standardized job description across the system. So people basically, mostly they end up doing predominantly education and a bit of research. This is all to say that I was in a situation to structure my experience as I wished, uh, which I suppose is very lucky. I, I did offer to get involved in research education and evidence-based practice. The fact is there was limited interest in my participation in this. And uh, being older and wiser, I accepted that and thought to myself, well, given the resources available in this situation, because I don't want to move, I don't want to go to a university, uh, I'm going to deal with this. So I've already told you about my awareness of the research framework. Uh, I also learned that uh, the VA is not interested in doing discipline-specific research. So I actually am very interested in <laughs> discipline-specific research. I'm interested in nursing practice within the nursing home. Lastly, and this is all not to complain, but this is, this, this is the fact. These have been major issues for me to, to deal with. We do not have a nursing research university aligned with our VA. We don't have a nursing school aligned with us. So, you know, the resource environment is uh, unique, challenging. And I spent a fair amount of time early on networking. You know, it's like I tried to milk every opportunity. But um, it, it ended up being, um, the experience that I had. Um, my slide is not moving. OK. So what I did is I did sort of a basket full of things. Because although I had a job description of a research nurse scientist, I wasn't asked to do specific things because the nature of the organization 
was that these two other research neuroscientists uh, sort of did their thing, and really it wasn't an expectation. Well, that may seem fun, but I wanted to be sure that I was using my time wisely and staying connected with research in some form or opportunities in the VA that could complement research. So that's why early on in the introduction mentioned these various and sundry things I, I did. I just scooped up any opportunity I could. I got more involved as the second vice president, Zeta Mu. I mentored students. I have some clinical work. I've become a member of a national work group, national work groups, and they're listed there. These are things that were sanctioned by the VA. Uh, the Breakthrough th Series is ongoing. So I'm, I have been able, but not in an easy, quantifiable way, to influence the development of these programs through the meetings I have attended and the phone calls we routinely have. Uh, just now, literally in the past two months, uh, because I am alone now that two other people are not there, um, I am modifying my role to be more actively including uh, being a resource to the nurses. I've met with everyone and identified myself. Uh, it may sound odd to you, but truly it was not a situation in which my um, expertise was appreciated. And at first it was, I hurt my feelings, and then I thought, oh, well, that's just what it is. I'm just going to make the best of it. So I need the next slide. So what did I do? I kept busy. I submitted grant proposals, you can see. I, any research activities I participated in, probably one of the best things I did was that I got connected as an investigator with large research groups uh, that had lots of resources nationally so that I could get, so I could experience their team meetings, their just it, just the way things go along in a normal, uh, you know, multi-member research team. Uh, so that was great. And I, you know, I wrote, I've done presentations, I maintain whatever I have done, I have always maintained an awareness of the priorities of the VA and health services because if someone were to ask, why are you doing this? I could say with a straight face that it really connected to uh, community care, long-term care, geriatrics. So because I had some time, I also thought, well, I'll experience some, some board activities. And I'm happy I have, as you can see. And the benefit of that in particular has been that I've been able to be a voice for nurses practicing in nursing homes. It's not a particularly attractive practice environment or something that people readily think of, but, but that's been the means by which I, have, I am hoping to advance uh, people's awareness uh, of the nursing home clinical experience. Could you move to the next slide? Currently, I am morphing into a for real role as a research nurse scientist in my mind. Um, now, uh, let me put it this way. There are clear expectations of what the department is wanting. They are not wanting, truly, a very, very vigorous program. Now, if I were younger, I probably would resist that and think, oh, I'm going to try, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. I've been there 19 years. I totally get what that's all about. So in the context of that organizational and political environment, I'm going to do my best. And what is it? I'm on a national research advisory group. I'm mentoring uh, students still on two boards. I'm getting more involved in evidence-based practice. And we're trying to get into the groove of morphing the evidence-based practice projects, or at least the foundation, the clinical topic, into pilot studies. And, and as was mentioned previously, realistically, I think pilot studies are the name of the game, funding with foundations. 
Uh, and so any, any kind of program that is aligned with some kind of research entity, like our performance improvement program related to safety is aligned with a major safety center in, in the VA, so I've gotten to know those people and, and networked to the extent I, I could. I'm a, a clinical coach on uh, one of the programs that's been uh, uh, set, uh, maintained over the past years. Could you change the slide? Okay. So <laughs> I, I'm laughing because I'm thinking that I hope you get a sense that you can actually be in a somewhat restricted environment and produce something and be happy. Uh, I think that I, what I learned mostly, even more than the, the research process, is to be very observant, see things as they are, make the best of it. I, I literally feel like I've been an expert in squeezing out every single opportunity I could. I've, I've been smart politically. I've been flexible. Uh, uh, this is not exactly what I had envisioned uh, my experience would be. I thought I would be doing much more research with colleagues and uh, I realized, as in all research, it's so important to be responsive to VA priorities. Unfortunately for me, as a practical matter, emphasis on nursing homes and institutional long-term care has simply diminished. It's a fact. There's, le there's less of a budget. As you might imagine, there's a focus on the Iraqi and Afghanistan vets, as there should be. So, you know, research is focused on that. But I have done my best to stay up with the rest of the non-VA world because one thing that happens when you're in the VA is, you know, you get into how VA works and you need to to be successful, but there is the whole other world. So I definitely have worked to stay connected, to go to meetings, uh, to, to be on committees. Uh, my main thing for me is to be aware of what's going on in the world with Medicare and Medicaid in the United States because the VA isn't funded as other nursing homes are. So if I were to lose my connection with the changes going on in the general healthcare system as it relates to nursing homes, I would very quickly become kind of uh, incompetent. So lastly, I would say be realistic and opportunistic and use, what, use whatever opportunities you can to advance your uh, agenda. And so for me, I've been able to stay true to focus on pressure, also prevention, safety, staffing, uh, nursing home health services. Uh, so I mean, it's, it's, it's uh, worked out. So I'm going to conclude now, and I sincerely apologize for the source of all that noise. I know it's so aggravating to be on a, a call and have that kind of thing going on. Anyway, thank you very much. I appreciate you taking the time to listen to me. I know we did have one question. Um, it was from Kimberly, and she wanted to know for you, Mary Ellen, what types of frameworks did the VA prefer? Um, they prefer that there are different um, there are different quality frameworks. Organiz you know what? I <laughs> off the top of my head, I can't tell you. There, if specifically, there are implementation science kinds of frameworks. Their approach to qualitative research is a, in a particular way. Um, the way this, the proposals are constructed is in a particular way. I suppose the best thing I could do, and I'd be happy to do it, to send to give information to the caller that's much more specific, because um, I, I can't answer the question, but I need to um, just go through the specifics that made me uh, contribute that comment to you.
And does anybody else have any other questions? The conference has been muted. The conference has been muted. The conference has been unmuted. Hi, thank you so much both um, Doctors Overcash and Doctors Delafield. This is Ashley speaking. Thank you so much for sharing with us your um, educational and leadership journey. The question I have for Janine is, what challenges have you faced as working as an NP while maintaining your leadership and scholarship in the College of Nursing? I'm just thinking of those who may be on the call who still are practicing, but still who are interested in um, doing scholarly work. So how have you been able to um, feel like you could give both of them the justice that they, they deserve and need? Thanks, Ashley, for that question, because I think it's an ongoing target, and there's days where I don't know that I do them all well, right, because it's a big, it's a big load. But what I try to do is pick the low-hanging fruit. You know, the things that I'm working with in geriatric oncology are the things that I talk about, the things that I write about. So I'm always very efficacious in how I'm targeting themes in which to develop. Right? It's things that I'm doing already. And that's how I also frame my leadership opportunities. So I'm, I'm not all over the board. I'm pretty centralized in terms of what I do. And that's good and bad, right? I mean, you know, unless you want something to me to discuss geriatric oncology assessment or something like that, I'm probably, you know, other than that, I'm probably not your person. But it has afforded me an opportunity to mind my time to do, you know, some relatively good work and not have to be so spread out that I'm, you know, trying to keep everything in the air. But it's hard. As an NP, you know, when I'm collecting data when I'm seeing patients, so then I come back to my office, I'm the data entry person. I'm the IRB person. I'm the data analysis person. So I'm it. I'm a one-woman show. And so there's days that I'm better at that than others. You know, that's... May I just add a comment? That I think that um, th that's that's wonderful, and that is really, I think, the typical experience that one is very focused. And I'm quite aware that I'm not focused, but I just wanted to mention you, you how in my mind I see coherence, because I'm interested in the context of practice. I've worked in nursing homes. I know what what a tremendous impact they have. I know all the programs, MDS, care plans, quality improvement, you know, all that specific stuff. But I felt like it was important to know all of that and, and whatever I studied in specifics that I was very aware of the actual practice context. So that's just a, it's just a, a different approach. I think that it's uh, less traditional, and I just did it because of circumstances. Thank you both. Do we have any additional questions? I any think last Joanna minute? has a, Yeah. Go I ahead. think Joanna has a hand raised. Joanna has her hand raised. That I don't know how to take care of that. You just touch it. So, Joanna, do you have your hand raised? Are you able to type the question for Laura? Um, it looks like my hand is not raised. Okay. Well, as we end this um, webinar, if there's, if there's not anyone else who has any other comments, um, any last-minute words of wisdom you would like to share with our, our attendees? I think Emily just asked, this is Janine, about uh, yeah. a question about um, she spoke of being a one-woman show and in many respects given multiple roles. Can you speak to the best way to stay self-motivated? Boy, I don't know about that. I think, you know, you have to take everything in bits. When you look at the whole, when you look at everything, I think it's, it can... You get encumbered. You don't want to start down the path because it isn't a straight path. Pick your battles, right? Pick the first thing you're doing, something that you're an expert in. 
and maybe you expand on that. You do a few review articles, and then you may want to start collecting data. So all of a sudden, you may all have, have developed this whole trajectory before you know it. You know, that can happen relatively briefly over a couple years. But to stay focused just means picking apart small pieces of it, right? And not getting too, don't get in the weeds. And a lot of times you have to, you know, maybe have a mentor to, to be, or someone to talk to, to say, oh, I'm a little stuck here. It's interesting, we can all give each other advice. Sometimes we don't take our own advice or our self-speak, but we certainly can give advice to others and to keep those people around you. You know, I'm very grateful to have a phone call if you, get stuck or get, you know, you're not staying Hello. focused or whatever. Dr. Gunther? Give me a call. Yeah. Hello, this is Vanessa Johnson. Oh, hi. How are you? Hi. 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 Hi.